Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, my, uh, my wife's off visiting her family for the week, and I've, um... I've managed not to lose my mind over the first 24 hours, and that's something of an accomplishment, I figure. I did almost lose my mind going into New York City twice this past weekend. Um, On Saturday, I drove all the way into the West Village to record next week's show, and on Sunday, I I drove to Weehawken and took the ferry over to meet up with past guest Dmitry Samarov so we could see the, the whole buy an exhibition at the Morgan Library while he was in town. Did a lot of walking as a, as part of the Sunday trip. Saturday was this utter gale of a, a storm, and so there was very little I could do in the city. Uh, in fact, you'll hear the rain plinking off of the air conditioner outside the, the guest's host's window while we were recording. But anyway, um, I'll just say... It was nice to walk around the city. It was good to catch up with Dimitri. It was good to record a, a show with a new guest on, on Saturday. But but I got to say, it's all kind of tiring for me nowadays as as I've just gone so long without, well, going anywhere. I mean, I'd have consolidated everything into one day, but the podcast was flying home on Saturday evening. And Dimitri wasn't going to be in town before then. So, you know, not a bad time, all things considered. And eh, now I get to decompress by being alone for almost a week and not talking to anybody. I do have a board meeting this Thursday, which is also adding to, you know, anxiety, etc. But um, in fact, I, I ought to go prep for that. So let's get to this week's show. Um, my guest is Kathy Koja, who's been on a few times before and is back to celebrate the launch of her her new novel and immersive happening, all called Dark Factory. The novel is published by Meerkat Press, but but there's a whole world beyond the book, which we'll we'll talk about. Um, Dark Factory is a nearish future novel about um, the club scene and virtual and augmented reality raves and the dynamic between the Dionysian and the Apollonian and sex, drugs, and dance music and a thriller of a plot. Um, it's a really good novel. It's really fun. It's a it's a very energetic book in terms of of the story and and Kathy's crystalline prose and and the vitality of her characters and the whole environment that she creates, the whole world that she builds. It's centered on a club promoter named Ari and an immersive experience creator named Max, who's much more analog focused than the the vr heavy ari um but there are plenty of intriguing characters and concepts throughout the book uh including a a literally mind-blowing dj uh and a reporter who tries to bring narrative sense to the world and and um kathy and i talk about her character a little bit uh in in the conversation but over the course of the novel there's a lot of exploration of of what our realities are and and how humans experience the world and and relate it to others and what it means to um well to to transcend ourselves and i don't mean you know upload your brain into the cloud tech bro sort of thing but the ways in which uh well the nuances of experience can uh, can open the third eye if you get me and all of that stuff is ineffable but you know we try and eff it as best we can but Dark Factory is really a fun novel by itself. The thing about it is, over at darkfactory.club, Kathy incorporates more, we'll say material, I hate to use the word content, in the form of interviews with or, or writings by her characters, including supporting ones who don't appear in the novel, 
but are alluded to, or you can figure out who they are based on, on the reading of the book and, and video clips and characters, DJ playlists, mask designs for, for readers to, to make at home, a graffiti room, uh, in-person events, a VIP section where people can upload their own ideas and, and playlists and more. And, you know, Kathy's got a lot of experience creating immersive fictions. So seeing her integrate that mode with a novel is awfully fascinating. Oh, what I'm saying is Dark Factory is a fun read, but it also creates a whole world that Kathy and readers can continue to build on and, and enrich and get something from. In an era of lockdowns and, and paranoia and just heavy polarization, it's kind of amazing to see someone create a platform like this, like a world where we can dip our toes or, or dive headfirst into. Anyway, go read Dark Factory. And while you're digging the story, like I said, there is a thriller of a tense plot to it. I, I'm not even really getting into the content of, of what the, the story is about. Um, I'll just say rave, club scene, virtual reality, go read. Um, but also go enjoy the world Kathy's built at darkfactory.club and, uh, and make your own mark on it. Now here's Kathy's bio from the book. Kathy Koja writes novels and short fiction and creates and produces immersive fiction performances, both solo and with a rotating ensemble of artists. Her work crosses and combines genres, and her books have won awards, been multiply translated, and optioned for film and performance. She is based in Detroit and thinks globally. Her new novel and immersive fiction project is Dark Factory. And now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Kathy Koja. Where did Dark Factory originate for you? And how did it evolve over the process of not just the novel, but everything that you're about to tell me about, about what Dark Factory is? Well, it's really odd and interesting that the genesis of, because everything that I write always begins with a character. And for Dark Factory, that character was Ari. And what is what was striking to me is that I had been working on uh, a book that I could not make go um, set in Berlin, and it, it just was not happening to the point that my agent said, you know, there's no law that you have to write this. <laughs> you could put it down. But I'm really stubborn, and which which serves you poorly sometimes, right? When you just, if I only just did, yeah, no, no, no. And then I realized, okay, look, the only person in here that I have any interest in is this one character. What if I took him out? And as soon as I took him out, everything started to flower around him. And what was interesting about that circumstance was my very first novel, The Cipher, had an uh, almost identical beginning. I was working on something I couldn't make go, and I took out the only character I had interest in, and he brought that whole novel in with him. So, But other than that, they could not be two more different <laughs> reading experiences, yeah. not even a little bit. Um yeah, and so that that was Ari, and Ari is uh, he's a party boy. Ari is a producer. Ari is someone who knows how to make things happen, and I just followed him. And it was clear working on this. It's funny because I have been on this project for far longer than it ever takes me to create a book, and almost exactly four years, which is unbelievable for, you know, I'm, I'm a hit and run girl and wow. But this project, I've got lists of things that I knew I had to accomplish, but I had no idea. How do I have flowers involved? How do I have music? And I know these things are part of it. I know they're part of it, but I don't know how. And so I really wrestled with the, the format 
just of the words on a page. How am I going to make this work? And it became clear eventually it, it wasn't going to work that way. It couldn't work that way. There had to be another format. There had to be a way to allow those components to 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 flower as part of this narrative because they were part of this narrative. And actually this morning I was reading in The Guardian, um, Emma Smith, there was a, a interview with Emma Smith, and she's talking about the technology of the print book. Um, and she says there's been a lot of discussion about ebooks and how they would either kill off the book or develop into fascinating multimedia objects, but actually neither of these things have happened. But they actually have happened if you let them happen, right? If you, I, th I think people can sometimes, we love our experiences with print books to the point that we can, I wouldn't go so far. Constraint? As, yeah, I was going to say fetishize. Yeah, the, that's certainly a, a part of it. When you get people who say, I won't read ebooks because they don't have the smell of books, exactly. that's, that's bullshit. There are other reasons not to read ebooks sometimes, but yeah, the attaching that sensory thing to it is, yeah. Um, and that's fine. Shopping. I mean, you can do that yeah. if you want to, but what what bothers me is that as a writer, I know that the book is the words and everything else is a delivery system, Right. Everything else is only a delivery system. If I sat down with you and told you the story of Dark Factory, it would still be the same story, only with a different delivery system, right? So getting all up on a book is, is a print artifact, I, I just have no patience for that anymore. Sorry, Emma. <laughs> no, it puts me in mind, uh, and it's a, a great episode I did. Well, pandemic time, everything's a blur. Uh, Ryan Hughes in in England, or in, uh, uh, gosh, I, mean, I think Scotland, mm -hmm. did a novel called XX, uh, science fiction novel very recently. Ryan is a typographer, font designer, graphic designer, and everything else, and incorporates all of that not just into the appearance of the book, but makes the various elements that he's using totally integral to the experience of the book, such that if you try reading it as an ebook, it won't make any sense. You can't format some of what he did right. graphically and typographically within the, the book. But again, different experience, but something that is taking something unique about the book and making it, you know, as part of the story, not just a gimmick, I suppose. And it, when I was trying to figure out how I was going to make all this work on paper, I tried to find as many as I could. And I, I asked friends and readers and people I knew what books are doing what you just described, what books are using yeah, this only came out two years ago, so it would have been after Dark okay. Factory. And, um, there's yeah. a, and it's 900 pages long also. <laughs> well, and then, I know that's part of it too, is that you, you can do, you can do things on paper, but sometimes you can only do them once. Yeah. Um, there's a book called. His next novel is about 300. Well, so, and yeah. not only that, it, there's a book called S. And I'm blocking on. Oh, that's the uh, is that the TV yes, guy, yes. DJ Abrams, yeah, yeah, yes, right? Yes, yes yeah, with yeah. someone else, right? And I would be hard pressed to read that thing more than once because the experience. It began to feel like when you start panicking on a scavenger hunt and just start randomly opening <laughs> the envelopes. It's like there is so much here that I'm not feeling this narrative. OK, I'm not I, I can't follow your narrative because and that's why when I Trisha Reeks at Meerkat Press, who is publishing Dark Factory, when we talked about the iterations of it, we were just adamant that even though this whole entire site exists, Dark Factory Club, where this the story is exploded out and you can you know follow as many threads as you like. We wanted to make sure that the print book and the ebook could both be enjoyed on their own. You did yeah. not have to do anything else other than this. It was there. How challenging was that? Because that's something I was I was interested in, and it puts me. But uh, first, Doug Dorst was the other guy, uh, along with J.J. Yes. Abrams on that book. As I just looked it up Thank because you. it's the one advantage of doing these remotely is that I can goof around on the internet. Well, yeah. I mean, look things up for key research while while talking. Um, but it put me in mind. I was thinking of that question because many years ago I got into this 
we'll say discussion about uh, Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell's uh, graphic novel about Jack the Ripper mm. from hell. And one of the things about from hell is the extensive uh, uh, end notes that Moore wrote covering almost every panel of every page to the degree at which some things might not make sense on the page unless you went off and read the end notes after. And to me, it was Samuel Delaney I got into this discussion mm. with, okay, argument, whatever, um, that if the if the comic pages in that case themselves aren't telling you enough, then the writer has failed in some way if he needs these explanatory notes in the back for you to make sense of what you're you're seeing. Uh, Chip did not agree and felt that everything is this gestalt that the book all comes together with the supporting material and the thing itself. But to me, the comic reading experience in particular, juxtaposing that with, let me go flip to page 455 to go see what this note says about this panel that I just read, disrupts the flow of it all. It's and like in your case notes, for this book, right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, just, it's end notes in this case, mm -hmm. but same thing. If you have to do that, I think you're ruining the experience of reading the book. And that's one of the great things with Dark Factory as a prose book. It flows. You can read the bonus material in there and, and get more for it, uh, from it, but it's not integral to the story itself and the main, the main body of the book. Right. And you don't, you can, like any, any experience, whenever I have created live event experiences, there is stuff there on, you know, as far down as, as I could go to help you dig deeper and deeper and deeper into whatever this experience is, but you don't have to do any of it to still have a good time because... How much of that exists for your other novels that didn't actually, you know, that doesn't get produced? Like how much of a Bible do you make for your own fictions? Um, mostly it's a roadmap to yeah. say, okay, here is like a thousand post-it notes, but they all end up getting, you know, integrated into the herd. So yeah. there is... I wonder whether you, you make stuff... You know, for other books like this, but they never get. Nah, you know, no, this was day. this okay. was a, an experience, and I think part of it grew out of. I won't say it's because of the plague, because it started happening before the plague. But I was not able to do any more events after January 2020 was the last one that I did, and that kind of connection. Not only making the environment, but watching how people relate to it. That for me is the, that's the payoff. I love to see not only people reacting to what I made, but people doing their own things with it. That's the best. You're like, okay, I, I created, it's like putting out a bunch of, you know, magical sandwich fixins and watch people <laughs> you know, do what are they going to make? What are they going to make? That's so exciting. And that's one of the, the things that both Trisha Reeks and I were super set on from the beginning. It's like we want there to be a playlist on the site that people can, you know, add their infinite songs to. We want to have like the mask contest. We want to have we're going to have other components of, you know, fan art and writing and to be able to open up this world and say, I, I mean, I said that in the in the dedication, I made this for you, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. Right. Yeah, how much, once the pandemic hit, how did that change what you were doing with the book and your, your approach to it? No, like you said, you wanted to, to capture that feeling, but I'm sure that was part of the novel even before. Oh, what absolutely. What did the pandemic do to you? Absolutely. Yeah. But I think, I don't know that it changed the book at all i don't know and i can't know really i mean i don't know i don't on the surface things for me did not change insofar as i work at home anyway so i wasn't suddenly isolated or you know cut off from i was cut off from friends and collaborators you know that that was hard but i'm still at this desk every day you know, no matter what, rain or shine, plague or no plague. So I, I really can't answer that because I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if it changed your, your mindset about what you were trying to do or trying to, to capture, given that there were points where we may have thought we're never having these sorts of events again. No. And we, and unless we were all wiped out, we're going to come. You, you always had the sense that, 
society and and connection are going to reassert themselves, but in what fashion? I will say that in some of the very early um, drafts, because this book went through a lot of drafts, which is also not something I normally do, yeah. but there were times where you would see the landscape of, you know, whatever city they're in or whatever they're doing. And there weren't a lot of people. And that was kind of, whoa, okay, right? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's in there, but I'm not seeing it. So, but there are people in it now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it reminds me of the male, <clears throat> male friends of mine in New York describing that early pandemic spring as, being like Omega Man, yeah, you know, walking around New York and not seeing anyone there. And it was only when I started talking to female friends of mine in the city where they gave a very different perspective of what that means right. and, and how, how it you feels. can't go out. Yeah. And it was the, oh, yeah, this is the the potential horrors of, of the abandoned city as we know it. But but what was it that, that you know, required so many drafts? How did it change for you in, in that way? Well, because I'm a little dense and I kept fighting it <laughs> and fighting it. I mean, on the one hand, it's good to be stubborn because I don't know if I could have carried this through all, you know, through our, our, the jolly years that we've lived through without a little bit of stubbornness. But I was so fixated on the format because, you know, it's like trying to put together the puzzle without the picture on the box. You have some idea of how these things go together, but, you know, am I making Abraham Lincoln's face or like a sequoia forest or a mural in a men's room? I mean, what am I making? And I had to keep going back and back and back and putting those pieces together, 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 together. And one of the things that's been really gratifying to hear from readers pretty much universally is that this thing slaps this thing you get in it and you just go it's like yeah. oh i'm so pleased because that was not my experience at all <laughs> yeah. i i didn't want to tell you it only took me like two three days to read <laughs> because i figured it's one of those i, don't, I never know if writers well i know matt ruff appreciates that like when i've talked to him it's like no i, I like when i i write a book that just propels people oh, totally. through it but at the same time, it's, I spent four years on this. You know, I, I can understand how, you know, you, you might not resent it, but, no. you know, just but spend more time, really get into it. No, but. that's what it's supposed, that's what it's made to do. And it was, it was kind of making itself in that sense. And I was there to, to help it along. But, you know, and I'm not super woo about projects or, but things really do have a life of their own. Any creative project has a life of its own. And you, you do best to keep your hands off the wheel as much as possible. You know, keep your, keep your foot on the accelerator, but keep your hands off the wheel because otherwise then you end up right. Wasting like a year going, I'm going to make, no, you're not going to make it that way. It's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Woodring, the, the cartoonist once, uh, he did something with a character that he believes the, um, the the greater force of the universe was against and basically did a second graphic novel changing that entire history, but redrew like 200 pages oh, of, of yeah. work because uh, Jim has a, a relationship with the creative force that is very different than anything I have experienced with anybody in this this podcast history. But but yeah, I can understand that, that degree of... of thinking you're in control of something that you really need to, to let breathe. And you would also think that you feel coming in from the outside of whatever this is that, I mean, this is your job to shape this material. This is your job to, and it is, but the, the longer I do it, the more and more I realize how so much of what we're all doing is, what is veiled to us, or it might have references for people and anyone who's ever written anything or written a song or whatever, people will come up to you and say, oh my God, this was about such and such. And it wasn't, but it was. You don't yeah. say, oh no, that was actually about the, it's like, not for them, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Now those resonances and it's, you know, it's a, on a meta level, it's something you address in the the course of the book. The 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 different, I would say, myths or the the, the different you know ways cultures have approached 
what meaning is and, and what narrative is, and then trying to bring those things together in some sense. Although, again, I may be overreading into what's there. <laughs> no, no, no. It is very much. And that's why I like the, the juxtaposition of Max and Ari, because Max is so Max is so in his head at any given moment. And no matter what way he's trying to, whether he's, you know, a kid playing a game or a, a very ultra serious art student or a very ultra serious installation artist, he's always thinking a hundred miles an hour and in, you know, many different levels at once. Well, what does this mean? Well, what is this for? Well, how does this signify? And Ari is not that at all. Ari is Ari takes this instinctual level of process and puts a layer of, you know, real world nuts and bolts kind of thing. Where do we get the booze? How do we do this? How do we do that? How do we do that? And it was fun for me to realize afterward that both of those modes are the way that I approach my own work. If Like if I'm making a, an experience, a live experience, um, first you have to write the script and you're doing that yourself, you know, alone in a room. And after that, that brain shuts off. You're done with that brain. And then you start thinking, okay, as a producer, as a director, how am I going to make this thing happen? And that's a completely different way of using your energy. And it can be very, I would imagine, let's put it this way. It's probably more fun to spend a night out with Ari than it is with Max, <laughs> But you might think longer about what Max told you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the, the notes, the, right. the, the, the ways of seeing what's there and then what's, what's above there. Yeah. yeah so designing new, or, or creating new experiences beyond the book or for the book? For the book. You, for the book. Yeah. Um, this coming week as we as we speak on uh, on May 10th I'll be in Atlanta for a live stream launch from Blue South Recording Studios and we will have lots of fun and games there and we planned a long time ago and when I say we it's I'm speaking of Trisha and myself and I would I'll also just use the royal we but, right, but go on. no yeah. <laughs> I would also like to circle back too so please remind me yeah. to what she has done as a publisher because it is unique in my experience and I've been doing this for a long time so but she and I planned there will be that launch there will be um, bookstore events that will be both live and streamed there will be another live and streamed uh, launch party in Detroit when I come back we're looking at doing another event in Chicago and we're trying to expand, to offer people the feeling of dark factory, the feeling of, you know, this boundaryless party and this, this party at the, at the end of the world or at the edge of the world, whatever, in as many different locales and as many different modes as possible. Hmm. And the the relief of being able to do that after two years of, of, you know, being shut in, basically. I'm excited to see how people react. And I'm also excited. One thing that I have found, and I found it for myself, too, uh, a dear friend was playing a concert in New York, and I'm in Detroit, and in, you know, the before times, I would have tried to find a way to get there. And, you know, but because this was now, um, it was being streamed. And when I, you know, logged in, it hadn't started yet. And I will say, too, for this concert, the tech was immaculate. So the, the people presenting it did a gorgeous job. But a bunch of my friends from around the country were in the chat and we were all talking and it was wonderful to be able to have those conversations with those people while we were watching without being a dick to what we were watching, right? Or yeah. being a dick yeah. to the other people around us, or we were disturbing no one. We were able to enjoy it and say little things back and forth, like, look at his shoes. He's got such bitchin' shoes. <laughs> and, and while completely enjoying the live concert. So I don't, I don't know that we've lost 
we've lost a lot, but we've also gained something. And I really, really hope that bookstores, especially in venues, don't go completely back to live only. I think that's a real loss because we all learn through necessity how to c connect technologically, no matter how much of a phoebe you are like me. You know, there, there's no We're doing one, this. Yeah. Right. Who doesn't know how to do it now. Right. So why would we let that go? Right. Yeah, I've seen, you know, with, with newer book tours coming around, they're often saying hybrid mm -hmm. event. You know, if they're doing in person, they're still again, the infrastructure's there. You know, it's it's we're now realizing, yeah, you, you know, you can get by without a, a movie grade camera. You, you'll be OK. We'll just set up a an iPad or a phone. Right. You know, for the, the in-person. And people event are and fine with that. that. People aren't going, oh, this isn't, you know, people are perfectly happy with it. And it also gives a dimension that was not available before. And again, why would we not take advantage of that? Yeah, yeah it's been a it's been a time of discovery discovered that I can rock long hair, which is something we really didn't right? know before. I know, right? I love that idea of putting it, like, up, gel that thing up into some antlers because antlers are, like, so central to the Dark Factory experience. Yeah, talk about that. Tell me about some of the, the symbology that, and, and some of, we'll say, the research that, that went into the book in terms of the, well, again, in terms of everything. Well, the, the antlers and the, the horned man mythology, I... It's just so fun. And there were also horned women back in the day. And some people, some cultures, the, the horned women, the women dressed like deer and came storming out of the woods to like fuck people up, which is great. And then other people or menly people said, hey, we're going to do that too. So all these people run around with horns on. And it is that, that symbol of what interested me the most was not so much the symbol of like, potency or although that's certainly in there but of ecstasy and yeah. the idea that you are you're completely taken out of and simultaneously plunged into your circumstance and yourself but at an elevated and it doesn't even necessarily mean like elevated in the sense of oh then you fall back to earth but it can be a real opening up and depending how profound it is, uh, it lingers. It can, it can really change a life. Um, one of the, the concerts that I was thinking of, I'm a big fan of Seeger Rose and I, I've seen them live and they were it, you know, just beyond amazing. If, yeah. if you have a chance to see them, do not pass it up. But there was an art opening some years ago when I was just starting to, to work on this and at a, a disused bank in downtown Detroit. And I have forgotten shamefully the artist's name, but it was an installation of a house made of mirrors, like a ranch style suburban house made of mirrors in the lobby of this bank. Right. And I'm looking at this and saying, Hmm, that looks interesting. And then it said that Yonsei would be playing there. I said, well, that can't be right. How can that be right? No. That doesn't happen here. That, that, and I'm sure he's going to be playing in this bank, right? So, but I said, well, don't be an ass, just go. And I went and I thought, okay, maybe he's like, you know, streaming in or that, that would make sense. Okay. Maybe, you know, whatever. They are certainly known for doing spectacle and, you know, beautiful things. So that would make sense. I'm thinking maybe he's going to be streamed onto the house or something. And then I was talking to this woman who was a photographer and she said, oh, I got to go. I got to set up for Yonsei. I said, are you fucking kidding me? He's like on site right now. And he was indeed on site. And he performed in the, this bank was massive. And he performed on this mezzanine at the very back. And there were about 100, 150 of us clustered underneath and way behind us, past the glass house installation, were the people still having the opening and having the drinks and the snacks and the chatter. So you could hear that kind of, you know, oceany rumbling back there in this echoey place. And then there was him. And I mean, it was it was a peak experience. You know, there there aren't I, I wrote this entire book to try to describe how that feels, right? And Coming out of there into 
this night where the, it was, it was kind of chilly out and the very fine rain was falling. And I walked to my car and I texted my son and said, I just saw Yonsei. And he said, Oh my God, what planet are you on right now? And that was perfect, <laughs> right? It's like, I don't even know what planet I'm on right now. Uh, I was thinking of him. There's a, a, a Mark Ronson documentary, uh, Watch the Sound, a, a, a docu-series mm. where he focuses on like different uh, one episode's about reverb. Uh, another one was about auto tune. But he, he gets, I think it's Yonsei, in a, a performance he was going to give in some gallery where they had to get everything as white as possible to eliminate the attendees sense of space oh, cool. and then get the, the reverb and everything else. And, and like everything that went into creating this oral environment and, and visual environment that just was meant to completely displace anyone who was in there and, and have them just lose themselves basically. Which yeah. is harder to do than we, we really cling to our sense of self and depending who we are, we might find that kind of experience to be frightening, right? Rather than pleasurable, or you might feel like, oh, you know, oh no, I didn't, I didn't come here for this, or I didn't want this. And I wanted Max's experience in the book. I didn't set out to make it so, but that's how it, it came out. Max really has to struggle with this feeling of things are bigger than I thought and things are expanding because of my, my creative relationship with Ari and things are changing in ways I don't like because I can't control it. And all he can think to do at first is run away. Yeah. And you, you have that line about hypocognition, the uh, inability to recognize something we can't understand. Right. Right. And, and the, well, I mean, you know my story. I, I got my diagnosis last summer, and right. it was, hey, congratulations! All the micromanaging control freak stuff didn't mean anything. I know. <laughs> Here's <laughs> your the gold star. You <laughs> yeah. What's your hurry? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Buddhist friend of mine. Um, I, I said, you know, I realized after all these years that my hands were never on the wheel, and he said, you know, when you really transcend, you'll understand there is no wheel. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get there at some point, but yeah, you know, for for now, don't rush me. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's stages to these these ascensions, I guess. But and there there really are, and the stages are part of the beauty of it, though. The stages of all of it is part of the beauty of it. This, I mean, the stages of making anything, or when you're drawing something, to be able to to put you know your implement on the paper and be done in two seconds. What would be the fun of that? What would be the the pleasure of creating if it's that easy? So what's the the dynamic or the tension between doing something like this in prose, which means capturing it, versus the um the the, the time based experience of, you know, experiencing something like this? You know, trying to capture something that's meant to be, we'll say ephemeral, I guess, if if that's a appropriate term. Sure. Yeah. I, I, how tough was that? Or, or how did you really try to, to surmount that? It wasn't, though, really, because they're both going after the same timelessness, right? When you're in the middle of an experience, time disappears. And when you're when you're lost in a book, time disappears. If you're if I've done my job well, then all of that is happening to you right? You, you and I are participating in making this happen. I've created the conditions and you brought your energy to it. The same as it would in a, in a live event. The only difference is I can't watch you read. Hmm. I mean, I could, really, could sneak up on you, but that wouldn't be very nice. So I, and I usually sit in funny positions anyway <laughs> when I'm reading. People <laughs> right? be like, who is that weird lady at my window? Hi, it's me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just pulling this blanket over myself, trying to hide. Yeah. Know, right? <laughs> well, you tell me what is what was your experience of this book? Oh, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I'm just thinking in terms of the linearity versus nonlinear. You can go back and read a paragraph again, mm -hmm. but the moment the moment is gone. You know, in 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 the imminent experience. But uh, you know, again, I think you capture the rush of it. Like, there's a, a major chapter in the middle that's long and a lot of things happen. And at no point did I think, oh, I'll take a break after 15 pages and go do something. It was the 
you know, constantly compelling it. And in a sense, it had the beat of the the sort of EDM that you you bring into the you know, that that it creates a soundtrack for the the book. Um, some of these these sections kind of build their own, I'll say, their own rhythm or their own pace like that. Which again, I find fascinating, and is probably a good chunk of the four years and multiple drafts and revisions that you were you were referring to. A lot of the music is obviously very very important because not only is this a, a story a narrative about a club, um, one of the major characters, Felix, is a DJ who begins to understand or begins to experience life as having a much greater soundscape than he had ever understood. And, you know, what does that mean to you if your life is about, he had been, he had, he had trained and, and uh, wanted to go to school as a classical pianist. And he then became a DJ. And all of this is about sound, 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 listening, listening. What does a, and musicians, when you, when you, go into a space, you know, you're thinking, how is the space going to acoustically enable what I want to do? How, how can I use the space? How is the space going to reflect what I want to, what I want to play and how I want people to feel that. And I listened to so much techno writing this book, which made me so happy because again, I'm a, I'm a Detroit girl. And so this was, was, was my home territory and techno is, is a lot of the beats. Like you can listen to a particular DJ set and because of the miracle of YouTube, if you click back and forth, which you shouldn't do, but you, if you do, you will see enormous changes from, you know, at 20 minutes to 47 minutes, but you have been taken on this, you're on this beautiful, you know, conveyor of sound, you're not even noticing intellectually all the changes you're going through, right? And the, the way the beat changes and the minute changes and the way it builds. And that, that's the experience. That to me is what, if anything, I tried to DJ this book. I'm a big Underworld fan, but I I, well, I can't mm. listen too often because my wife says it gives her seizures. Oh. So that's, uh, <laughs> which uh, yeah, I I understand. So you know, but yeah, it's it's there's definitely that sense of of that integration, I suppose. Yeah, and to me, it's always been a, a big challenge for writers when in prose you're trying to capture some other art form and something that's supposed to be very good in that that mm. other art form. Um, a friend of mine joked that the the movie that's at the center of uh, Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean's Signal to Noise is supposed to be this this grand you know masterpiece of this guy's career that he's composing in his head. He's like, but everything in there would be like five minutes long. Like you know, right. the, the movie that the, right. the guy's trying to create, really, there's no way that would sustain for two hours. So, yeah, it's it's that challenge. I I think you you rise up to. And not just in a single genre, with, with music and with other areas, you manage to bring what those experiences are like, I think, in, in the form of prose in a really fantastic way. So congratulations. Thank you. I, I, I want to bring in Trisha Reeks now, too. And oh, I have this written down, Trisha Contribution. So yes. tell me about Trisha's Trisha's contribution. Trisha's contribution <laughs> is, you know, again, I have been a, a professional writer for a very long time, and... I have never seen this level of not only creative enthusiasm, but the willingness to swim in completely uncharted waters. N neither of us knew exactly what form this project was going to take when we embarked on it. And we both said, you know, let's make this happen. Let's, I, I pitched her the idea and we talked about it and she was down. She was down from the beginning. She continued to be down. She continues to be down to this day. And not only the, the head spinning amounts of work that Meerkat has put into realizing if you go to darkfactory.club, you will see how much work has been done with daily posts, with the contest with the, you know, the, the creation and curation of the site itself. Um, the content is mine. The creation is Trisha's. 
and yeah. the visual inspirations and, you know, the, the cover we agreed on very quickly what the cover would look like. And we were both very happy with it. And I mean, even things like right now at my desk, I'm looking at the paper dolls, which I just fucking love these paper dolls. <laughs> They're so fun. And that was our watchword through the whole thing. This should be fun for people. This should be enjoyable for people. Um, the, the mask contests that we had where people created these super cool antlered masks, very different styles, nothing at all what I expected. I was really blown away. And the contest prize was this beautiful silver dog tag on which, uh, Sophia Zakia jewelry created this piece of art and on the dog tag is a selection from the book, some of the text. And Sophia asked me, how do you want this to, to look? And I said, I do whatever you want. I mean, you, you know, you're the artist, you should do what you want. And she found a way to make this text look like it's in motion, the way you might look at words underwater, or it's just brilliant. And they're, because of Trisha's, involvement and because of Trisha's collaboration, we were able to offer these things to people and have, here's this, and then there's this, and then there's this, and we're going to do these launches. And I have never seen this level of creative integration in any publisher ever before, ever. So I really wish that I really hope for Trisha to get recognition in the industry for doing this, but I I just don't know who else would have, and you know, people talk about independent publishing. I can't imagine a major house that even if they had both the vision and the desire could like, no offense, but stir their stumps enough to make it happen. They're, it's like trying to turn an ocean liner around, right? It's like- you know, All I think of is those those authors who- or cartoonists too, who get their first big publishing deal and their first big release. And then it was, yeah, the publicist quit two weeks before the book came out. For real. So for real. Yeah. Or so, I... so everything just falls apart like that. Whereas seeing something like this with that level of dedication. Yeah. That's, that's. And something. because she was, it wasn't me saying, okay, Trisha, here's like, you know, a PowerPoint here are the things we're going to do. We really, so much of those are things that we brainstormed and, you know, ideas that even, even there's a, a section on the site where there are some flowers where there are these really amazing floral displays. And Trisha found this florist in Baltimore, right? Who could, who understood what we wanted. And that is right. That is not a person sitting at their desk going, okay, here's my list of things to do today. This is someone who is completely creatively plugged in to what is happening, to what the, the project is. And that's really I forget rare. If, I, I, I forget if we talked about it. Have you seen Dior and I? Yes. The, the documentary? Yes. Okay, good. Because that, mentioning the flowers now reminded me of that, the right, that, that flower that, room, right? <laughs> that came up a few times during the, the book itself. I was thinking, I need to make sure she's seen that because the experience I had with that and what you see when people see that for the first time, when you see somebody else's experience, you know, vicariously, you, you know, you get the impact of something like this on, on someone that's a. Uh, and even in yeah. that film where you see the corporate people have to come in and look at the building and stuff. And that's like a whole layer of bureaucracy that really. Oh, yeah. All the process. It's on and, the vibe. And, and right? we're talking about. Yeah, all the the RE side of yeah, we need to make sure we can keep the flowers on ice and that we get this list done and these people and and you know. But even before yeah. that, when they like have to sign off on it, and that's oh, yeah. the part that can you know really strangle the vibe. It's like oh well, we can we. It's like you know what you hired me to do this thing. Let me do this thing, and you will be happier for it. You will be, everyone will be happier because it will work the way it's intended to work. If you start throwing natural roadblocks come up all the time. And I have seen that happen over and over in my live uh, events, mm -hmm. things will happen that will stop you. But it's sort of like you're the, you know, the little, the little video game character and you hit this wall and then you bounce off and go on another wall. 
because that wasn't the right way for the project to go. So, yeah. but those are natural. Those, those come up on their own. You don't need to engineer them. But that, that makes me think of Alexander McQueen too, who is a huge oh, hero of yeah. mine. And if you remember his, his show in the, in the church called Inferno, which was his first really serious show where he had a little bit of money to work with. And I mean, all his shows were serious, but. But yeah, the first one at that scale. At, right at that, at that level. And the only one that was repeated because he then did it, it, it was so impactful that he ended up doing it again in New York at a, a, a I don't know if it was a unused synagogue or, or a disused or a de consecrated or whatever you do with a church. But the idea was this fashion is his medium, but art was his business. And he's another one, leave him alone, you know, give him money and leave him be, and he will come back with things that are extraordinary. And all the, all the ways he made use of music and robots and flowers and animal motifs and all the things that he put together to create this total experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I admit not getting it, getting it like uh, ascribing early on, ascribing too much to the, 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 the fashion side of it. The, well, these things are impossible to wear. Why would anybody do right. this? You know, and, and having to, as we talked about having to reframe my brain and just have the, it's the experience. You'll get the ancillary stuff afterwards that, you know, is consumable, you know, in a different way, but this is something higher than, than all that. You know, it just took me so long to, I don't want to just say accept that, but to open myself to it. Um, and then seeing the McQueen uh, exhibition at the Met was the, oh, okay, yeah. no, I get it now. This, this all makes sense, you know. Um, and yeah. that he that he had this total vision because there's a, there's a book called Inferno um, pulled together by the photographer that worked on the original. Um, and I don't have it in front of me because I just loaned it to someone the other day. But the idea is they went back and contacted all the people who worked on, you know, the milliner and the jeweler and the models and all these people who worked on that show. And they all say over and over again, you know, it, it sounds cheesy to say, but it was a moment. It was a moment. It was, there was nothing like it. The energy was palpable. And that's what Dark Factory is trying to, to access as well. That feeling of energy, that feeling of you are part of this, you are part of something that's happening and it's alive on its own terms. And now you have added your energy to it and made it better. And we are recording this on uh, um, Beltane, I guess. That's on, on right. May 1st. That's right. It's <laughs> May first. We should see. We definitely should have antlers for this. So yes, and we should sort of fire somewhere. Uh, you, you have you done the Burning Man thing? I Is have not a... done the Burning Man thing. Okay, I, you know, I only came across it in my, I guess, mid college years when Mondo two thousand was a uh, right was around. If it goes back that far, it might have been later years and in, in Wired and, and all that stuff. But me being a kid, you know, I, I've never gone and have no no interest whatsoever, especially nowadays. But yeah, I. I I don't know what, you know, how much that sort of thing would, would, I don't want to say influence, but, you know, uh, well, the, uh, bleed into your experience. At the end of the book, there's a, a thing that is happening as the, as the book kind of, yeah. I don't want to say ends, but as it turns into something else called dark. Which Puck. is a further question of mine as to whether this is going to end. But, right. You know, well, and we'll, the idea we'll is these, they're doing this event in this kind of, and this, this is the kind of environment that I personally love a lot. It's like this sort of, you know, old machine shop that was turned into a studio and it's in this kind of fucked up field with these, you know, trees and, and scrub vegetation and, you know, it's sunset and all the birds are coming into the trees and they start doing this event, this music. And that feeling of expansion where everybody is part of it, but it is something that is bigger than everybody there and that it keeps going and going in the world. I think that was kind of 
a lot of the spark behind, no pun intended, the spark behind mm -hmm. um, Burning Man, right? I mean, it, it started out as one thing and now, but that's where, and it, that is, that's where McQueen too is a very cautionary tale, not just because he chose to, to end his life so sadly and so young, but the fucking pressure of money, right? The pressure that money, the literal pressure that money puts on anything and money is, is a bully basically, right? Money is, money makes an excellent passenger, but a very bad driver because money can only go one place, right? You'd like to have it around because it's useful, but you know, you never allow it to, to totally drive or shape the experience because it's just not that smart. And it just drives it for its own sake. Right, right. And all goes is in one direction, right? It always goes towards more, 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 more. You know, you're like, mm, that isn't always the best place to be. And creatively, often it's the worst place to be. Any thought, not not the Facebook side of it, but any thoughts on the whole metaverse, AR, VR thing? I mean, it's it's part of Dark Factory, but, you know. Uh, but but from your own perspective, I guess. Well, and, and I had to do an awful lot of research about AR and VR because I know nothing. And what was really interesting and I guess inevitable is the research that I would do in month A by month C, so much of it was you know, already obsolete, right? Or are trending that way, or you're like, okay, so you can't necessarily. That's why I created the idea of, you know, why reality, as it's called in the book, because we have no idea. And that is a that's a an art form and, a, and an entertainment form that is barely begun. And it's taking hell's own time to get started. I don't know why. Some of it, I would think, is, is technologically based. But I think the idea of a metaverse is quite old, right? It's. And I think it's, it, it borrows everything from the natural world, right? Which we're so joyfully destroying day by day and living in a created universe like that is so inherently limited unless you turn it over to the AI, then all bets are off. Then we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll be in the matrix and that'll be it. Right. So, and, yeah. but yeah. I think that it's it's a it's a seductive and a and a nourishing idea too. We we already know instinctively that everything's connected, that we live in a metaverse. And so it feels right to us because that part of it is right. But again, there's so much fucking money involved and the attempt to make money is again, it's it's never the reason to do stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's the 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 constant, you know, oh, you can enter our branded reality. I know. And, you know, spend your time there. It's like, yeah, no, you're, you're, well, again, it's the same thing. We all create our, our little silos and cocoons of uh, our intersection with the screen and, and who we are there. Right. But I also, right, I don't want to enter your branded reality Cheetos. I mean, yeah. if I want to eat a bag of Cheetos, I'll eat them. I won't. But if I did, I could. But no, I don't want your version of what reality should be. What is most <laughs> engaging is the idea of everyone engaging. On the other hand, when everyone engages, you're going to have a certain proportion of raving assholes. So, yeah. and many of them are the tech billionaires, oddly enough. So <laughs> funny that I know, right? <laughs> But yeah, that that sense of you know, well, there was a, a whole series I wanted to write with the um, the, the new meanings of of words like fulfillment and moderation, right? Um, because yeah, the idea of moderating who we are or what you know what's allowable and what happens when you don't moderate, um, as we see, you know, the the neo Nazis come rolling in and. Uh, yeah, it all comes off like a weird Norman Spinrad novel. It sometimes. really does. And and because we're seeing it happen all across the world as, you know, where where democracy is, you know, suddenly having to really jump up and fight back and in, in some places, you know, quite literally fight. None of this is an accident. And one of the things that 
I was so struck by over and over working on this book in such awful, awful times was how much the book was about joy. It is absolutely yeah. about joy. And that I have a little note on the, the top of my desk thing that says life depends on joy. And Which is my name in Hebrew. But is that right? I never tell people that. Oh, yeah. I, I never tell people because, you know, I'm, I'm horrendously depressive and everything else. But but it, in theory, it, it's Hebrew for joy. So. All right, then. Well, you're That's ahead something. of the game, then. <laughs> no, I started out strong. <laughs> I yeah. know, right? Good for you. <laughs> so has Dark Factory become a, another book? I hate the term sequel, but, you know. Who knows? I hope that I'm – I. I would hope. Is it a universe you're happy to write about enough that you'd want to go back? There is so much more that could be done with yeah, yeah. this. I was was talking to my agent, and there's a the film my film agent, and Matt said one of the chapters um, when right before all the the activity goes down on the roof of Dark Factory for the first time, he's like, you know, if this was a series, this could be one whole episode there is he's like you're done in like four pages but this could be one entire episode there's so much here so yeah i i spent too much time with this book telling it what it was going to do and so i'm ready for it to tell me what it's going to do and i'll just execute as best i can yeah oh, I'm, I'm i look forward to whatever incarnations it takes there were moments that I visualized in terms of how this would be done either in movie or, or as a TV series. Um, they're just key things that I thought, Oh yeah, no, this would actually work perfectly if you elongated this moment and did this visually. But, you know, luckily I'm just some schlub from New Jersey and not a, a studio <laughs> guy. But Are you a, a game player or do you like me avoid those things because you'd have a horrendously addictive personality and just play them all the goddamn time like Max did? No. And <laughs> I, I am not a game person. I love to read about them. Oddly, I yeah. love to read about games and environments and the people who make them and the, the difficulties and the, it's such an alluring art form, but especially VR and AR stuff, I have atrocious motion sickness. I was going to ask because I've never tried it and I assume I would be, you know, I get motion sickness too. It doesn't, yeah. It. I mean, I have motion, I've always had it as, and one of the gifts of age is that it's come back with a vengeance. <sighs> I can't imagine trying to do a hell of a lot of VR without having to barf. So that avenue is kind of close to me, but in a way it made it I could only experience it by reading about it and looking at it. And that was a, for a narrative brain, that was a great way in. And that's not, I mean, it's a, it's a real art form and it's a total art form in that, I mean, in a way it, it's, it's our age's opera, right? Cause that used to be the thing about opera. It, it's everything. It's music, it's yeah. drama, it's, you know, it's a breath mint, it's a dessert mint. It can do everything. <laughs> And that's what a game is. A game has music, it has drama, it has visuals, it has interactivity, right? So it really is the art form for now. And I would like, there's a character who comes in and this guy came out of left field. I had no idea he was, was part of any of it till he showed up. But there's a, a game creator, um, a disgraced game creator who comes in almost at the end of the book and this guy is wild. I could do. Yeah, I, I felt that you had a lot more to, to say about him. He, yeah. There is a lot. There's a lot more I could say about all of them. I mean, there's yeah. just there's a lot there. But his whole way of looking at games was in a in a in his his own way extremely spiritual as a spiritual enlightenment tool. And he was was very un, unpleased that people were not seeing his games in that way and that they were misunderstood. So, but yeah, I would love to see, I would love for the motion sickness thing to be dealt with if it could be, cause it would be so fun to do some of these experiences that I can't, but for now I just have to, to look at them from a, a, an admiring step, a step or two back. Yeah. Sort of reminds me of of William Gibson actually getting a computer for the first time and not realizing how loud they were <laughs> after, after getting the Neuromancer money and, and you know right. basically shaping the future for us. He finally got a computer. He's like, oh, these are so loud. <laughs> it's terrible. And and so much of what 
our our technology is still tactile to us, right? I mean, you and I are using devices to speak to each other and right. in a way that we couldn't do any other way right now. But some of that is inherently um even even in the the rooftop scene in Dark Factory where Felix the DJ has to use this, you know, this clunky little you know, literally battery powered deck and but yet such things do exist, which I found out afterwards, but the technology is part of the way that we do this. And it's a, it's a, a physical, we, we are interfacing physically with these devices to make stuff work. So that is also very much part of it. You can't, uh, Max, when he was young, his, his, or when he was in school, his nickname was meat man because everything had to be, you know, this very purest way of saying, no, you can only have things that occur, you know, in, in quote unquote real, right. In quote world. unquote yeah. real world. So, yeah. So second to last question is identity just narrative plus hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because one of your characters says so, and I, I figured that out. He does ask. say yeah. so. Identity is just narrative plus hallucination. I think that, and I, I'm not trying to, to fudge the question, but I, I think identity is almost a personal question to everybody. I mean, where do you locate your identity, right? Where do I locate it? Where, what if we lost it might destroy that identity, or what bolsters it? Or is it intrinsic to, you know, our meat sacks? Or that's one of the one of the questions or one of the engagements that people can have with this story. And yeah, I don't have a definitive answer to that. I I, I couldn't. Good. I'm I'm glad there's nothing that I, I either should have known all these years or you know, that we're going to disagree about to the point of not becoming not being friends anymore. Last question: Who you're reading right now? Um, Ish, you know what, what's been on your nightstand or your Kindle? I recently reread Asterius Polyp, which made me happy. Oh, wow, that's a Kelly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I recently reread it, and um, Maurice Meyer is someone who I love to read, and I read in um, in Galley Lindsay Lerman's new book, and those both those two women's voices are people I'm very excited about and I wish everybody would read them because they're both neither one of them writes like anybody else and and they don't write like each other and they they just don't write like anyone else but when you have experienced one of their books you will know it but I don't read a ton of I don't read almost no fiction when I'm writing and because this thing has still been in process, 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 I have not read a lot of fiction. Are you still creating more dark factory supplemental bonus? I hate the term content I, writing. No. Yeah, absolutely. They actually, there are two, um, two with Trisha and I are calling them moments, um, where there are these little, I guess, moments of different characters that I'm not sure how we're going to utilize them yet, but I still have to write Ari's and I still have to write Max's. So, cool. and I have a question for you yeah. before yeah. we finish the, sure. the forgotten character sometimes in this book is Marfa. And I have to ask because Marfa is of a journalistic bent. What did you make of her? Liked her. There were moments where you, uh, where we know Something is going on, but we don't know what it is. You know, the, 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 we know she's got, you know, uh, at least a plot or the reason to advance, you know, what what's going on unseen. Um, but yeah, liked her. Didn't think she was unreal or flat. It's difficult, especially given the, I'd say the tech world side of things to have female characters who are actually convincing because something about tech just makes everything boring and masculine. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I think between that and the queerness of Ari and his world, right. you know, you, you bring a lot more roundedness to a world that could be uh, too, too flattened, I guess. And especially because the, the whole nightlife world too is meant to be, you know, it can be an extremely queer world. There's a, 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 interview that Tom Cardamone, who's a real writer, did with Ari. And Tom asked, and I'm, I'm not 
paraphrasing it well, but he is basically asking Ari, you know, why, why is nightlife so queer? And Ari is like, well, because we invented it, Tom. And which is, I want, I wanted to create that feeling of inclusion. And I wanted to create that feeling of this big, beautiful, you know, dark, exciting world for anybody who wants to enter this project. And I want everyone to feel welcome. Um, someone had asked me, would you give this book to a Trump voter? And I said, well, I would prohibit no one from reading right. any of my books. And I would certainly welcome them to, to the factory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a place for everybody. Yeah, That's uh, and there's the openness and the the if somebody wants to experience this, chances are they're going to open up in different ways. Right. That I would guess. be the that would be the hope. That would be the the blessing. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Anyway, Kathy, thanks so much for coming on. I, I do want to um, actually ask one more thing. Have you watched Mythic Quest on Apple TV? I have not. Oh, watch that. Right. Um, but hey, we'll, we'll talk about it after. Anyway, are you going to be in the New York area anytime soon? No plans at the moment. Um, I have family in the area. So and because I have not. Been oh, that's a good to... reason to stay away. I'm sorry. That's that's my <laughs> no, standard. No, it's a family that I, <laughs> that I very much want to see. But so that will will draw me there. But um, at the moment, no. OK. My other question then is, are you anywhere near Grand River, Michigan? Grand River? Grand River is a is a, a large. Oh, I thought it was a town. Avenue. Okay, I, I've got, Grand Rapids. No, I've got a, a company. No way! I will have uh, to look Gra that up. Yeah, news yeah, to I'm me. Gonna, I mean, there's Grand River Avenue, which is like a big giant thing. I will have to look it up. Oh no, I'm sorry. They are in Grand Rapids. Okay, it's, it's a town called. It's a company called Grand River that's in Grand Rapids. Ah, okay. okay. Grand Rapids, land September. of enchantment. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're bringing me out in September to, to go visit them. So, oh, cool uh, beans. Well, let's we'll try just, to like meet in the real world if we can. That would be awesome. That's my hope. You know, we'll, we'll have this virtual thing, but, you know, there, there does have to be as as Max refuses to go forward at one point until he can get a, an in-person meeting with Ari. You know, you and I need to, to sit down and talk. That would be so. wonderful. And Grand Rapids is such a such a place. <laughs> yeah. I won't spoil it for you if you've never been. It's such a place. Never been. My only Michigan has been Kalamazoo uh, to go visit Pfizer ah. back when it was Pharmacia many, many years ago. Okay. But, you know, these oh, guys dude, are. We need uh, to get you to Detroit. I, that's what I'm saying. I've never been. And I haven't been on a plane in 26, 27 months. I know. So, I, know. I haven't been yeah. on a plane since 2019. I can't imagine I will be flying to Atlanta next week. It's like, do I even know how to be on a plane anymore? Just keep the mask on oh, and yeah. not the one with the antlers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kathy. This has been great. Thank you, Gil. Thanks for having me. And that was Kathy Koja. Her new book slash immersive fiction is Dark Factory, published by Meerkat Press. You can find the book online and in better bookstores. But for the full experience, like I said, you should also visit darkfactory.club, where there is so much more in, in a variety of media and a variety of ways for you to, to add to the story. As I said, it's a, a fun novel in and of itself, but Kathy's also conducting a, a great experiment in in narrative and not so narrative storytelling with this this whole blend of the linear and, and the immersive. And the darkfactory.club site has links to other social media where the experience keeps growing the way things do on social media, like the Instagram feed Dark Factory Club. You should also check out more of Kathy's work at her site, kathekoja.com, which is K A T H E K O J A dot com. She's on Twitter and Instagram as Kathy Koja, uh, all one word, but she hasn't posted anything on Instagram, it looks like. And I'll have links to all of this stuff in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, if you want to support the Virtual memory Show, um, write to me or call me. Tell me what you like and don't like about it. Uh, tell other people about the show. Tell me who you think I should record with, uh, what movie or TV show, immersive experience, book, music, 
piece of theater, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that through email or sending me a postcard or a letter. I love postcards. You can find my mail address on the bottom of the weekly email that I send out. Or you can leave a message on my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about uh, me picking up and getting stuck in a conversation with me. Um, and messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you're going to go real long, It'll hang up on you. You got to call back. Also, let me know if you do leave a message, uh, whether it's cool for me to use your message on an upcoming episode of the show. I would never do that without guest permission, but, you know, I figure I'll check. Now, if you have money to spare or other resources, then give to individuals and institutions in need. Um, you can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, and other crowdfunding platforms. Uh, that can, you know, you can help people with their medical bills. You can help them with their artistic projects or making rent or, or whatever. But, you know, you can help people out. And if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank. Uh, you should look up yours. There's the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Planned Parenthood, and other uh, pro-choice funds for women. Um, there's refugee funds. There are lots of things you can do if you've got a little money to spare that will help us build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 